Why would Isaiah want to specifically prophesy of the Latter-day Saints building the kingdom of God in the mountains, in the Rockies? The answer to this question goes into the fascinating history of the state of Deseret. That's the name of really the nation and kingdom that was Utah before Utah became a state. Now, the vision of Deseret was to create a kingdom and a government and a people that was entirely independent from all of the systems of the world, independent educationally, culturally, governmentally, economically, in every way establish Zion. So now when we come back to Isaiah and 2 Nephi, we understand why this is such a big deal. Why is Isaiah going into this? Because he's saying, wow, for the first time in thousands of years, Israel is literally being recreated and reestablished as a nation again. Today we are back into Isaiah as we go through a few of the chapters in 2 Nephi where Nephi is now quoting Isaiah. Now if you remember in the previous lesson it was Jacob, Jacob, Nephi's brother, he's quoting Isaiah and he's quoting it to the Nephites. Well now we're switching back to Nephi and now Nephi is going to quote several chapters in Isaiah that he feels are critically important. Now Nephi opens up with this explanation of why is he even quoting Isaiah in the first place? And it's really beautiful what he says. He explains that he wants to quote Isaiah as an additional witness to his and his brother's testimony. Nephi has talked with God. Jacob has seen Jesus Christ. And Isaiah saw Jesus Christ as well. And so you have these three witnesses and it's this law of two or three witnesses. Joseph Fielding Smith does a great job in Doctrines of Salvation just talking about how every time God talks to us, he always affirms it through multiple witnesses. You never have to just take one man's word for it. And that is one of the evidences that we can see that the Book of Mormon actually is the word of God, that it actually did come from Jesus Christ, is that it follows all of those laws. So here, Nephi is going to quote Isaiah as an additional witness to his and his brother's testimony. Nephi also explains that he wants to prove to us that Jesus Christ is going to come and that he is just delighting in the covenants made to the fathers that we've talked about in previous lessons and how Isaiah proves to us that God is a God of mercy, that he's a God of justice and fairness, and that unless Jesus Christ comes, unless God acts, unless he keeps these covenants made to the fathers, there's really no hope. And so Nephi actually explains that instead of Isaiah and his chapters being the dread of the Book of Mormon, right? Those chapters that we just want to skip. Isaiah actually should cause us to rejoice. And that is what I hope you feel, that spirit of rejoicing by the end of this lesson. Even though, full non-disclosure, this lesson is going to be maybe slightly controversial and a little blunt because Isaiah is blunt, but he's doing that out of mercy and he's doing that because he wants to help us in our day. Isaiah is going to explain what the problems in our day really are. So again, just as a really fast uh, foundation and recap, simplifying Isaiah. This is the story of Isaiah. First, ancient Israel rebelled. And because they rebelled against God and against the gospel, they were driven and scattered. And then through scripture, through the work of Joseph Smith, Israel will begin to remember who she is. And when she remembers who she is, she's going to want to repent. She's going to want to be different, to live differently, and to gather out of the worldly culture, the Babylonian government, the music, the art, the dress, the religion, the belief systems, they're going to come out. And as she pulls and she gathers out, God is going to be able to reestablish her as a nation again, as a people, as a government, as a culture. But the problem is, Isaiah goes into this, unfortunately, even though there's this amazing message of hope and redemption, most of Israel is going to reject this message in the last days. It's not just the Gentiles, the evil world out there, but actually most of Israel is going to say, you know what? I don't care that I'm Israel and I don't care that there's this plan. 
I don't want it. I want to stay in Babylon. Because of this modern day rebellion, God is going to have to use destruction and judgment to punish wicked Israel, not just the world, but wicked Israel as well. But the reason why he has to do this is to save the righteous. The righteous are going to be persecuted and harassed. And to save them, God is going to actually have to use destruction. And unfortunately, in the last days, this destruction is going to be so widespread, Isaiah says, that only a remnant will remain. In fact, Isaiah says there will be so few people left that a child will be able to count them. But even though there will be so much heartache and havoc, the people are going to eventually repent and they're going to rebuild. And that is when Zion and this perfect society will finally be established. So that is the story of Isaiah. So we're going to start here today in 2 Nephi chapter 12. This is also Isaiah chapter 2. And Isaiah is going to open up here explaining a prophecy that in the last days, a refuge of safety is going to be established. Let's go into 2 Nephi 12 here. He says, quote, And it shall come to pass in the last days when the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and all nations shall flow unto it. And many people shall go and say, come ye and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. And he will teach us of his ways and we will walk in his paths for out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem, end quote. Now, what is the correct interpretation of this passage? Something that I hope sets this podcast apart from just any other podcast out there is that when we began putting together the 4 our day model, this is when my father was still alive. And then, of course, as we've been developing this curriculum over the last several months, is we've been very intentional to try in every lesson to use the teachings of Latter-day Prophets. This is very critical and we've felt it's very important because any of us can try to interpret scripture, any of us can try to um, come up with meanings of these passages and the Spirit can speak to us and that's very important and it's very necessary and, and very valid. But God has sent incredible men in our day that were inspired from heaven with correct teachings and correct warnings and correct interpretations of scripture. And so we've tried our best to really include their testimony and turn to them often. And I hope that as we've been doing that, both in past lessons and as we do this for the rest of this course, you'll really see um, and begin to experience a feeling of gratitude, um, a feeling that I definitely have myself in these men and what they have taught and left us. So we're going to turn to Latter-day Prophets to interpret this passage in Isaiah chapter 2. Quote, The saints have come up here into the valleys of the mountains, and they are erecting the house of God in the tops thereof for the nations to flow unto. Now, of course, President Woodruff here is speaking to the pioneers and the Latter-day Saints in Utah in the late 1800s, and he's quoting Isaiah chapter 2. He continues, A standard of truth has been lifted up to the people, and from the commencement of this work, the Latter-day Saints have been fulfilling that flood of revelation and prophecy, which was given formerly concerning this great work in the last days, end quote. Now we're going to just go quickly to another passage from President Heber C. Kimball, where he um, affirms and adds a second witness to President Woodruff's words. Heber C. Kimball said, quote, It is often said here that this people are blessed above all other people. He's speaking to the pioneers and the Latter-day Saints in Utah in the late 1800s. We are in the mountains, but we did not come here of our own accord. We came by the will of the Father. We are in the tops of the mountains where the prophet, Isaiah, of course, said the people of God would be in the last days. Quote, and now he's going to quote Isaiah here. And it shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the tops of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and all nations shall flow unto it. 
end quote. Now, why would this be significant? Why, uh, other than the obvious facts of the saints coming to Utah, building temples, and the spread of the gospel, why would Isaiah want to specifically prophesy of the Latter-day Saints building the kingdom of God in the mountains, in the Rockies? The answer to this question goes into the fascinating history of the state of Deseret. That's the name of really the nation and kingdom that was Utah before Utah became a state. So when the pioneers first came to Utah, you have to remember they were leaving the United States. Joseph Smith petitioned every state in the Union for help, for redress of the grievances, for some sanctuary somewhere, any state that would allow the Latter-day Saints to practice their religion in freedom and in peace. And you know what? Every state either rejected or just didn't respond. And of course, after the martyrdom, the saints were forced to flee. But of course, in that process of evil men trying to destroy the work of God, they actually helped fulfill Isaiah's prophecy. And so the saints come out to the Rocky Mountains and they establish the state of Deseret. Now, the vision of Deseret was to create a kingdom and a government and a people that was entirely independent from all of the systems of the world, independent educationally, culturally, governmentally, economically, in every way establish Zion. This was originally the vision of Joseph Smith, of course, in Nauvoo and Kirtland and Missouri, create a separate society. We're going to watch a short clip here just about Joseph Smith's vision for Nauvoo, just to kind of give this background of the vision and the worldview that the Latter-day Saints were operating during the pioneer period. We've all heard of the family, a proclamation to the world. Well, Joseph Smith published a similar declaration in Nauvoo. Bob Matthews, he was a distinguished scholar in the church, particularly dealing with the Joseph Smith translation. And he listed this joint proclamation by Joseph and Hiram as number one on a list of important formal declarations. The proclamation of the first presidency of the church to the saints scattered abroad is significant because it was an official proclamation from the presidents of the church calling for every Latter-day Saint to gather and build Zion. This was a message for the entire world. The presidents of the church called every member to rise up awaken and fulfill the long foretold scriptural prophecies by emigrating to the New Jerusalem in America. The impossible had just begun. Israel responded to the call. Missionaries discovered a large concentration of lost Israel in Northern Europe. Did you know that an estimated 80% of church members during the 1970s were demonstrated to be of British extraction? 80%! Did you know that during a five-year period in the early days of the church, there were more Latter-day Saints in Great Britain than in the United States? The prophet Joseph Smith and his brother Hiram, as heads of the bull, or the tribe of Joseph, called for both a spiritual and a physical migration to Zion. These two prophets emphasized the importance of becoming an independent people. Let all those who appreciate the blessings of the gospel and realize the importance of obeying the commandments of heaven first prepare for the general gathering. Let them dispose of their effects as fast as circumstances will possibly admit without making too great sacrifices, and remove to our city and county. Establish and build up manufacturers in the city. Purchase and cultivate farms in the county.
Joseph and Hiram were fulfilling specific phrases from Isaiah 52. Depart ye, depart ye, go ye out from thence. Touch no unclean thing, go ye out of the midst of her. Be ye clean, that bear the vessels of the Lord. For ye shall not go out with haste, nor go by flight. But the Lord will go before you, and the God of Israel will be your rearward. Isaiah 52, 11 through 12. This is the literal fulfillment of Isaiah's words. If you were going to pick one time in history when these phrases from Isaiah 52 were specifically fulfilled, it would be in this proclamation. The people were called to separate themselves from all the institutions of the world, or Babylon. They were to separate spiritually, separate culturally, separate educationally, politically, and in every other way. All of their clothing would be manufactured by Latter-day Saints. Agriculture, it would be practiced on Zion's farms. Let us then concentrate all our powers at the city of Nauvoo, Strive to emulate the action of the ancient covenant fathers and patriarchs. The Nauvoo Legion embraces all our military power and will enable us to perform our military duty by ourselves. Textbooks and literature would be authored by men and women with faith in the Restoration. Our music, fashion, technology, inventions, her furniture, the news, the entire culture would all come from faithful members or like-minded individuals that would gather with Israel. Joseph Smith and the Brethren taught that we must not be dependent on the institutions of Babylon. The University of the City of Nauvoo will enable us to teach our children wisdom, to instruct them in all the knowledge and learning in the arts, sciences, and learned professions we hope to make this institution one of the great lights of the world. Two and a half millennia after the northern tribes were slaughtered and exiled, two sons of Israel, two prophets, were sent to announce, Israel, God is calling. Come to Zion. Come to Zion. The proclamation to the saints scattered abroad outlines Joseph and Hiram's plan to build Zion. They essentially state, we're building Zion. We're building Israel as a nation again in fulfillment of ancient prophecy. Come and join us. So when Brigham Young now comes to Utah, he has this vision and this dream of establishing the dream that Joseph Smith had. And so they went to work. And I'm just going to talk a little bit about what that culture of Deseret looked like, because a lot of people don't know this history, and it's pretty amazing. And it's actually kind of exciting, if you ask me. So first, education. Brigham Young began establishing academies and schools and universities all over the West. The forerunner of Brigham Young University was actually Brigham Young Academy. And when Brigham Young endowed or set up Brigham Young Academy, he actually said that he wanted it set up as a school where the scriptures would be taught with the curriculum, where students would actually be trained and educated to go out into the world and be able to successfully counter all of the false philosophies that were really taking off during that day. He specifically actually mentions Darwin. He specifically mentions socialism and communism. And he said, I want a place where Latter-day Saints can be trained how to fight back, how to be able to answer logically and with reason why the gospel of Jesus Christ is different and what the truth is. And so he establishes Brigham Young Academy, which is the forerunner to Brigham Young University for that very purpose. And other schools were set up. In 1850, they established the University of Deseret. That eventually became the University of Utah. Um, they had a school of the prophets where the men would get together and discuss a religious, civic, and economic issues. And actually, every ward, each ward, and the bishop in each ward was responsible for the education of the children. And they were supposed to report to an appointed superintendent. So every ward established their own school. Education was very important. Uh, you also have the Deseret Alphabet. 
And this is sometimes mocked and laughed at by people today, but they tried to set up their own alphabet that would introduce uniformity to the orthography and make reading and writing simpler and easier to learn so that instead of people spending so much time on grammar and English, they could actually devote that time to other studies. Uh, they set up other holidays. One in particular that's very interesting was called Humane Day. And the children were taught about the importance of treating nature and animals with respect and with care and with love. And they would actually bring the Latter-day Saint children in and they would have them write poetry about birds and animals and how to treat them kindly. Uh, there was a movement to move towards avoiding meat. This is not veganism or vegetarianism, not that. That's an extreme. So not that but being careful eating meat sparingly and being careful and recognizing and treating the animal creation with respect. Humane Day, part of the original Deseret. Um, they developed sugar and textile industries, their own telegraph, um, their own ironworks and bank. Uh, they established the first department store, of course, ZCMI. Sold everything from lumber to beauty products. Uh, they developed their own flags and banners and standards, their own icons and logos and colors, right? They're giving identity to a nation. It's not just about, oh, religion on Sundays and we learn about the gospel and theology and this immaterial philosophical uh, doctrine. No, it's very real and practical, and it gave an identity and a culture to Zion, to Israel. They're coming out of the world, and they're becoming a people again. You can see the symbols of Israel actually all over the original Utah Deseret history. Um, the original symbol of the honeybee, of course, has ties into the Jaredites. And we don't have time to go into all this, but you can actually study the meaning of the word Deseret and the symbolism of the honeybee. And it's all tied into rulers and government and establishing a kingdom. Again, a very political, economic, a very tangible nation. Um, the Lion House, right? One of Brigham Young's homes. What is the lion a symbol of? The tribe of Judah. This was all about unifying Judah and Joseph, coming together, establishing the kingdom of God again. If you look at the assembly hall, you have the Star of David literally right there on the assembly hall in Temple Square, right next to the Salt Lake Temple. You have Eagle Gate tied, of course, to Jesus Christ's prophecy in the last days that wheresoever the carcass is, there will the eagles be gathered is what Jesus Christ says. In other words, it talks about the gathering of Israel and angels being part of that and gathering physically. So they have, there's the eagle. Here is where the eagles have gathered. Um, so when Johnston's army actually came out and you can see a little bit of this, a teeny bit in the movie Mountain of the Lord, but... Um, we need to do a better job at telling our history because a lot of people don't know about it, but there was a time where um, an army was literally sent by the United States to come out to Utah to annihilate the Latter-day Saints out there. Well, what were they coming out to annihilate? Well, they wanted to stop this Mormon kingdom, this Mormon nation, this Zion that was literally being built out here. So now when we come back to Isaiah and 2 Nephi, we understand why this is such a big deal. Why is Isaiah going into this? Because he's saying, wow, for the first time in thousands of years, Israel is literally being recreated and reestablished as a nation again. And Wilford Woodruff talks about this. He says, quote, some felt their faith tried that we had to leave our lovely Nauvoo and go into the wilderness. Bless your souls, there would have been a flood of revelation unfulfilled if these things had not been so. In other words, the persecutions and the drivings and the mobbings actually was used by God to bring to pass floods of revelation and prophecy from the Old Testament. And then President Woodruff goes in and talks about Isaiah. He says, Isaiah speaks of the foundation of this great Zion and writes the whole of her history and travels up to the present day and from this time on until the winding up scene. Okay, what is he saying here? What is Isaiah about? Isaiah is literally the story of Zion in the last days. Everything from before, right before the time of Joseph Smith and, and through Joseph Smith until the Latter-day Saints in the pioneer time, Wilford Woodruff's time here, and then continuing all the way until the millennium. If you want to know what's going to happen, you want to know what's going to happen in the future, it's right there in Isaiah. He says, if we had not been driven from Nauvoo, we would never have come up the Platte River, where Isaiah says 
he saw the saints going by the river of water, wherein went no galley with oars. That's in Isaiah chapter 33, verse 21. So here is a prophet interpreting that passage. Then he continues, a great company of women with child and her that traveled with child. It's Isaiah 54, 1 would never have come here to the mountains of Israel if we had not been driven from that land. And a whole flood of prophecy would have remained unfulfilled with regard to our making this desert blossom as the rose. Isaiah 35, verse 1. The waters coming forth out of the barren desert. Isaiah 35, 6. Are building the house of God in the tops of the mountains. Isaiah 2, 2. Lifting up a standard for these nations to flee to, Isaiah 49, 22, all this and much more would have remained unfulfilled had we not been guided and led by the strong arm of Jehovah, Isaiah 40, 10, whose words must be fulfilled through the heavens and the earth pass away, end quote. So this was the vision of these Latter-day Saints. Let's fulfill Isaiah. It is time to reestablish Israel as a nation again. And they set up the juvenile instructor. That was the first children's magazine published west of the Mississippi. They had music at the University of Deseret. All the students were trained in music instruction, uh, theaters, dancing, fashion. You had the Deseret Silk Association. You had the LDS Hospital for Medicine and Midwifery. People were taught public speaking. They developed their own currency and their own money. You had the Deseret Museum, the University Bank, the Deseret Meat Market, the Deseret Mercantile Association, the Deseret Typographical Association. This was setting up a culture and this was the vision and this is what the Lord wanted to happen. Now, as far as the political side of Zion goes, um, Brigham Young and the Latter-day Saints, they didn't apostatize or forsake the Constitution. In fact, they said the Constitution is part of this. And we actually see this in the dedicatory prayer of the Idaho Falls Temple. So this is definitely, obviously, several decades, a while after uh, Brigham Young's time. But uh, in the dedicatory prayer of the Idaho Falls Temple, it actually identifies, it quotes Isaiah 2 and identifies that part of the fulfillment of Isaiah 2 is the establishment of the Constitution as law. It says, quote, We thank thee that thou hast revealed to us that those who gave us our constitutional form of government were wise in thy sight, and that thou didst raise them up for the very purpose of putting forth that sacred document. We pray that kings and rulers and the peoples of all nations may be constrained to adopt similar governmental systems, thus to fulfill the ancient prophecy of Isaiah and Micah, that out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem, end quote. In other words, part of the fulfillment of Isaiah was the coming forth of the United States Constitution by righteous men, righteous founding fathers. And Brigham Young and the other early brethren in Utah, they tried to really finally create a place where the Constitution was respected because it was not being respected in the United States. That's why the Catholics were being persecuted and the Native Americans and the Latter-day Saints, of course. And so the vision was we've got to establish liberty and we've got to establish this place of refuge. Now, why is this such a big deal to establish a place of refuge? Why would Isaiah be talking about it? Because what is going to happen to Babylon? right? What is going to happen to the rest of the world and what is going to happen to Israel if she does not gather out and create a place of refuge? I mentioned this earlier, but Isaiah says that the time would come when destruction would be so vast and so catastrophic that the survivors will be so few that a child will be able to write them. And this is what Isaiah talks about. So if you go to 2 Nephi chapter 12, verse 5, he says, O house of Jacob, come ye, let us walk in the light of the Lord, yea, come, for ye have all gone astray, every one to his wicked ways, end quote, right? The Lord doesn't want to destroy people. This destruction really actually is unnecessary, but unfortunately, it is a sign of the times, something that was specifically um, definitely pulled out from scripture by um, Elder Bruce McConkie or Joseph Fielding Smith when they create their lists of the signs of the times. You can see 
pivotal signs of the times in the last days is this rejection and apostasy from God. Peace is taken from the earth. The spirit ceases to strive with the wicked and there is wickedness. And this does not just mean people that are not members of the church that are, oh, you know, just that wicked world out there. But Isaiah and Nephi are actually very clear that this includes many of the Lord's people. You have to remember that Isaiah is written to the covenant people in the last days. And who are the covenant people? Are they the Jews? Well, the Jews don't have the covenants. They're not partaking of the ordinances. They don't have the priesthood. They are not being baptized. They're not uh, making covenants in the temple. Who is making the covenants in the last days? Who are the ones who are saying, we're taking the Lord's name upon us. We are coming to be his people and we're going to make covenants with God in sacred places. That is the Latter-day Saints. And Isaiah is speaking. So if you notice over and over in Isaiah's passages in the Book of Mormon, the term my people, my people, who are the Lord's people, those who are making covenants with him. So Isaiah warns frequently in these chapters, especially these chapters in 2 Nephi that we are reading here, that in the last days, rejection of the Lord is vast, and that if the Lord's people do not repent, they will not be safe and they will not be preserved. So he's warning us and he wants us to change so that we can be preserved. So how do we change, though, if we don't know what we're doing wrong? How do we correct our course? Well, Isaiah tells us. And that's where we're going to head into next.